Thank you. I appreciate the privilege and honor to speak with you today. And I'm speaking about the work of the Gideons. And there's a lot of things that we do, and I do appreciate it. The next slide, please. This is a summary of the... The next slide, please. Ah, there we are. The statistics. Statistics are just that, numbers. They don't mean a whole lot, but every one of the testaments that we put out, and we put out a lot of them, means we're reaching another heart of a boy, a girl, a man, a woman, and it's a testimony to Jesus. That's just numbers, as I said, but it gives you an idea of the scope of the Gideon ministry worldwide. I want to call attention to a couple of things on that chart. The first thing is the 201 countries. We have lost two major countries in the last couple years. Their governments have basically caused us to not be in those countries. This ministry is clearly under attack by the devil. And the way to do that is to attack his people who are either a part of it or giving it because he doesn't like the Word of God. The next chart, please. This gives you an idea of some of the places where we give testaments, where we put testaments out, and how many there are in the different areas. And we've put them out, I have helped put them out in many of those places. But we go these all these places are the traffic lanes of life. We couldn't do that without your help, and you can help us with the offering that they've graciously agreed to at the end of the service. You can help us with a memorial Bible offering. There's racks all over this church. Every dime that you give us goes to placing scriptures. The overhead is paid for by the Gideon's volunteers. The next chart, please. This gives you an idea how many scriptures we place by year. And you can see the decline, and that's due to the increased pressure that we're seeing and the loss of two major countries. That's a billion testaments or Bibles that have been placed 13 years. It took over 100 years to place the first billion 13 years to place the last billion. If we did that seven more times, we would be able to give everybody in the world one, one Bible. Wouldn't that be a wonderful goal? And then, in some places, that testament or Bible we give that person may be the only one that that village may ever see. We get all kinds of testimonies, people whose lives are saved and changed from all kind of stuff, from witchcraft, from all kind of horrors that we just don't understand because we don't live in that society. And they read the scripture and Jesus heals them and frees them and they're so grateful they write to us and we get volumes of these testimonies. There's a magazine that comes out every month or so and they just have one right after another. People who are saved and in their families. Layla in India got a testament in school and she read it, got saved, and then a whole bunch of her family got saved. There were seven total that that $1.25 investment brought to Jesus. And in the prisons, we see all kinds of different testimonies. People in solitary, you know, people in solitary don't have a lot to do. So if we can give them a, a testament, they're probably going to read it. And that's really pretty neat. We have a verse that we like to quote and talk about. It's Isaiah 55, 11. It's on the next chart. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not to return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I want, what I please, excuse me. And it shall prosper in the thing where I sent it. 
God's word does what God wants. He wants men saved so badly, he died for each and every one of us. And there's no one that is too terrible that he didn't die for. There's a lot of those people I would rather they just kind of like go away. But Jesus is not like that. He loves them. Let's look at this verse a little bit more. We know what the word is, right? We know that we're talking about God's word. We're talking about the Bible, Scripture. We're talking about who's talking. God is talking. And he's saying that this is going to go. The word comes forth from his mouth. Where do we see that again? We see that in Revelations, where the word came from the conquering Christ as he comes back. But there's more to this story than what's up here. This is only a part of the story. Christ himself said in Matthew 13, 3, and I don't have a slide for it, he said that there's a parable of the sower and the seed, and there's four kinds of soil, good soil, a path, rocky soil, and weedy soil. Now, I grew up on a farm, and when I read that, I bring my background, just like everybody else does. And when I read about the rocky soil and the thorny soil, <clears throat> I realize there's one, one real big distinction between those two things. Rocks are below the surface. Thorns are on, or weeds are on top of the surface. Both of those will nullify the work of the word. That's what he said. The seed, which is the word, he said that later on, is scattered or planted or sowed, and it's on rocky ground, or it's on thorny ground. In one case, it springs up, but there's no root, and it just evaporates. We all know people who have been in that situation. Thorny grounds, it's the cares of the world that come in and they choke out the life of the Word of God. But what are these rocks? They're the stuff that's inside us. The thorns are the stuff outside us. Now the Bible gives us examples of both of them. <clears throat> the stuff inside us is what we are. And when Jesus died, he didn't just die, he rose again from the dead to give us a new life. And he wants to take the rocks of our heart out, and he wants to put in good soil in its place. And the rocks are bitterness and anger and evil desires and on and on and on. He talks about them. There's a whole bunch of lists like that. And we find them in places like Ephesians 4, verse 31. They're the things that are in us that if anybody ever found out about it, we would be so embarrassed we couldn't handle it. But Jesus can take those rocks and get rid of them. And the funny thing about that is then if you take the soil the, and you take the rocks out of the soil, you've got good soil. When we were on the farm and we were working the crops, what did we do? We would find a rock, we would stop what we were doing, we'd pick it up and we would put it on our equipment and we would take it to the end of the field and we would put it someplace on the end of the field out of the way. And we were getting rid of the rocks. With high-tech equipment like they have in the last 50 years, okay, 60 years, sorry about that, we have to have, can't have hardly any rock at all. So good soil doesn't have rocks, and we had to take them out. And it's our job to let, and we can't do this. We are not strong enough. You're not strong enough. I'm not strong enough. We, I cannot take the rocks out of my life. I can only ask Jesus to do that, to do it for me. He's got to find it. He's got to identify it. He already knows where they are. He has to identify it. He already knows what it is. But he shows it to me. I give him permission, and he takes it out. Just a couple months ago, Jesus 
showed me an area of my life with unforgiveness that was long-standing and I mean really long-standing and as soon as he showed that to me I had to ask him to let me have forgiveness help me to forgive that person that situation what that was that was a long-standing rock and it was hindering my fruit now the nice thing about Christ is is that he does do that he does do that he wants to do that he died to do that and he's alive so that he can do that now the thorns those are the things in the world the Paul said that those are the what they're the things of riches and I like to say it's power pleasure and possessions they're the things that so many people live for and they come in and they crowd out the profitability and the fruit of the Word of God now we learned on the farm that if you plant your crops and they come up pretty soon at the same time a whole bunch of weeds start out and so you go through when the crop is little and you go through with this equipment that basically gets rid of the weeds but the neatest thing that happens is that as the crop grows it shades the weeds from the sun and it sucks up or consumes the nutrients and they can't grow and so you only have to weed your crops when the crops are young and tender because after that the crops take care of it and in a lot of ways the Word of God is like that if we put it in our hearts and we get rid of the weeds when the Word of God is first planted it will grow and sprout and it will shade and take away the nutrients from the things of this world that will choke us and make the Word of God of no effect unfortunately it's never a hundred percent so you always have weeds to get rid of I was talking to somebody yesterday and the question come up well I've been a Christian for a long time so what do I do about the weeds well it's never too early to start start planting the Word of God and let God prosper it and as the weeds grow keep the weeds from you know how do you do that you get into the word you pray and ask God to explain it to you you make it a part of your life in ways that you wouldn't otherwise and God will then get rid of the weeds the pathways how do you make a pathway in a field somebody cuts across the field you have a trespasser so you got to keep the trespassers out of your life trespassers are things people that come in and they walk across your land and they trample your crops we had a field that was right next to a golf course I hope there's not very many golfers here those clowns would come into our field to get those little white balls you could see the crops damage for the first so many feet next to the golf course they couldn't tell the difference from a stalk of corn to a thistle I don't know what their brains were but they would step on everything and they would destroy the crop so you gotta keep trespassers off your off the Word of God what's a trespasser I'm thinking in the context of today's message that it's a false teaching there's a lot of people that will tell you all kinds of things about the Bible and really what they want to do is they want to walk all over you and I'm urging you today as most as I know how don't let these trespassers do that so how do you do that you read a scripture and you ask God to explain it to you you get your direction from the Holy Spirit from the Lord and not from 
someone else. I had a pastor a number of years ago that I probably frustrated. Well, that's, I, know he did. I know I did. Because when he would preach, he would say something, and if I didn't think it aligned with what I knew Scripture, I would have, there's a concordance in the back of my Bible, and as he preached, I was constantly looking up passages that would he, was relevant to what he was saying. So I'm listening to what he says, but I'm also looking to see what the Bible says, not just in that verse. And you can't talk about everything in a sermon. It doesn't work like that. But I can look it up, and I can confirm whether or not the Bible was telling me what he was saying. I could let the Holy Spirit guide me. And it turns out that for that particular pastor, it's really hard for me to remember a time when he said something that I couldn't confirm in Scripture elsewhere. So there's three kinds of soil, and all three of them have no productivity. But the fourth kind of soil is the soil, the good soil, where the Word of God sinks down deep, and it prospers according to that verse. And it does what Isaiah 55, 11 says. It will accomplish what God pleases. And it prospers. And the numbers are really astounding. One seed makes 30, 50, 100. That is an incredible yield for a seed in those days. And that's what God's word is. And our part is to help the word prosper. Brad, I'd like to pray. In a group like this, I am confident that every one of us, if God would shine his light on us, we would find areas in our lives that are all three of these type soils, all four. Every one of us has good soil in it. Praise God for that. Every one of us has something deep in our hearts, a rock that God needs to pull out. And every one of us has thorns. I know I do. And everybody has a path where somebody's walking over you. So I'm going to ask that you repeat after me. I'll say a phrase, and then I'm going to, I, I know that's a little bit unusual, but I'm going to, that's what I'd like to do. Dear Lord... I want to thank you for what you did on the cross. I want to thank you for what you did on the cross. Show me the rocks in my life. Show me the rocks in my life. Get rid of them. Get rid of them. Pull out the thorns. Pull out the thorns. Work up the pathways and keep people off. But prosper the soil, Lord. Thank you for loving me enough, Thank you for loving enough. to be part of what you want to do. Thank you.